I think we should be reminded of the fact that it's not a choice between defense spending and all the other issues. It seems to me that it's um, a question of managing both better, because you make the point that the former is, after all, essential. And you've given us quite a lot of clues as to how that could be better managed, better forecasting, better estimating, um, <coughs> better accounting, uh, accounting for the problem that is not accounted for practically anywhere, pensions as well. Um, but I wonder, we've got a situation now with the oil price rocketing up, and it's rocketing up because of the threat of war, because of sanctions, etc. cetera. Um, and I wonder, uh, we haven't time to talk about it now, but I just leave um, that out there um, because every time there's been a spike in the oil price, there's been a recession that follows fairly quickly thereafter, and we just have to wonder whether we're not, in fact, as part of our thinking, uh, having to consider the possibility in, against the background of a fragile uh, recovery uh, occurring again. So now, uh, may I invite the panelists for our first panel to join me on the stage, Dias, Secretary Michael Chertoff, Ambassador Paula Dobriansky, and Jim Clifton, the panelists for our first panel, Reframing Security Priorities in the Age of Austerity and Interconnectivity. Dr. Stiglitz, we've got a spare seat up here, I think, haven't so, we? Yeah. Okay. Would you I'll like to join us, or would you prefer to stay <laughs> in the audience? We'd like that, may we? <coughs> Thank you. I hope I speak for all of us. I think we'd <coughs> like that. You Thank you. Great. Uh, if you don't mind going at the other end, that's fine. Um, I'm not going to go through the biographies in detail, but I do want to make one or two comments so we can listen with a perspective for those of us who haven't had a chance to read the biographies in detail. Secretary Chertoff uh, served as Secretary of the U.S. Department of Homeland Security from 2005 to 2009, during which time he led the country in blocking would-be terrorists from crossing our borders or implementing their plans if they were already in the country. His greatest successes have earned few headlines because the important news didn't happen. Ambassador Paula Dobriansky holds a Distinguished National Security Chair at the U.S. Naval Academy. She's also an adjunct senior fellow at the Harvard University's JFK Belfast Center and chair of the National Board of Directors of the World Affairs Councils of America. From May 2001 to January 2009, <coughs> Ambassador Dobriansky served as Under Secretary of State for Democracy and Global Affairs, the longest serving in history in that position. Jim Clifton has served as CEO of Gallup since 1988, a leader in organizational consulting and public opinion research. Under Mr. Clifton's leadership, Gallup has achieved a 15-fold increase in its billing volume and expanded Gallup from a predominantly U.S.-based company to a worldwide organization with 40 offices in 30 countries and regions. He's also the author of many articles and of the book, The, company Job the, Coming, excuse me, the Coming Jobs War. So, I would like to ask Secretary Chertoff to speak to today's security priorities based on his experience in government. Specifically... I hope he'll address the continuing debate over what constitutes the right balance between seeking to protect ourselves against a broad variety of security threats and respecting civil liberties. Not a question you haven't had to answer before. <coughs> well, first of all, let me say, uh, obviously, it's great could to I, be... Could I, before you start, oh, sure. just mention the other two who are going to, so we don't have to, and we can go straight through. Sorry, but we'll catch the beginning of your sentence in a moment. Uh, I then ask uh, Ambassador Dobriansky to speak from her experiences as Under Secretary of State for Democracy and Global Affairs, which entailed leading efforts on everything from democracy and human rights and labor to refugee and human trafficking issues to oceans and science, health and climate change. However, we don't expect you to cover all of those. Two will be a good start. Thank you very much. And finally, I would like to ask Jim Clifton to provide us with a look at the underlying economic challenges we all face today and to what extent they'll expand or constrain our ability to address the broad range of issues we're discussing. Now, all liberty in the way in which you approach that. We'll prepare remarks, I'm sure we'll address those. So um, the way we structure this is to ask each panel member to speak for approximately 10 minutes 
Then we'll have a general discussion and then integrate questions from the audience. We're on a tight timetable, so we'll try and stick to that agenda. So, Secretary Chertoff, yeah. very good to see you again, and sorry to have interrupted you. Oh, thank you. Th thank you, and um, great to be at this conference. Very distinguished uh, group of speakers over the next couple of days, and I'm, I'm delighted to participate. Um, let me begin by saying, you know, one of the challenges in evaluating um, security, any security effort, whether it's a war, whether it's domestic expenditure on security, is understanding what the cost of the alternative action would have been. It's easy uh, to go and look back at wars in Afghanistan and Iraq and say, here what the costs are. Uh, it's much more difficult to ask this question. Supposing we had done something differently. Supposing we had not gone into Afghanistan. Supposing after 9-11, we had shot a couple of missiles at bin Laden, as we did in the mid-1990s, and left it at that and not put any effort into Afghanistan. Would there have been subsequent attacks? What would the cost of those attacks have been? How would you measure the cost of those attacks, not only in terms of direct loss of life and damage to property, but collateral economic consequences and the, and the crisis of confidence that the public would have had in and the ability of the government to do um, and the state to do what I think de Gaulle said was the very first obligation of the state, which is defend the, to defend the people. So this is always one of the challenges in evaluating what's affordable is uh, it's easy to understand what you're spending. It's not so easy to understand what will happen if you don't spend. So that's kind of the, the, the I think, uh, the challenge and the conundrum of dealing with the issue of security. Um, in terms of the particular question of civil liberties, again, let me suggest that often this is presented as an either-or choice, and it's not really an either-or choice. Uh, that often security is the enabler of civil liberties. That's not to say that all security is good and that uh, all civil liberties ought to be sacrificed for security. That's quite plainly not right. I don't think that anybody would argue that. Uh, it is to say, though, that the idea that there's a one-in-one trade-off or a one-to-one trade-off, I think, is um, often overly simplistic and leads people into believing that they can't have both, security and liberty. And let me give you an example from uh, an issue which we confront now, which is the issue of cybersecurity. We all know that we have a huge amount of personal data uh, and information, including our financial data, our reputational data, uh, now currently online, reposing in uh, data storage locations in banks or credit card companies or uh, even in our own home computers. And when people talk about cybersecurity, how do you secure that from attack? from people coming in and stealing your credit card or stealing confidential information, uh, there's often a response, well, that's going to require invading privacy. Having the government uh, come in and put in security measures or require security measures in the private sector means we're going to have less privacy. But if you think about it, actually, <clears throat> privacy can't exist without security. Uh, the essence of our data privacy laws, whether they are in the US or in, in Europe, are requirements that the people who hold our personal data agree that they're not going to disseminate it or misuse it. That's the privacy obligation. And yet, if those trustees of our, of our information don't have the capability to execute on the promise because they are unable to secure their own infrastructure, that promise is worthless. And so for that reason, I, I, my argument is that in many cases, security re really is a, a fundamental um, foundational element of privacy. Uh, again, not to say that there aren't uh, choices that have to be made, but to suggest it's not quite as simple as, as a one-to-one -one trade off. So where do we, in, in, the, in the current world, where do we see security and security obligations? Um, I would argue that uh, in a world of global travel, finance, and highly technological leverage, a leverage, the ability of non-state actors to do damage that used to be reserved for nation states has dramatically increased. And this has transformed the, nation of, the notion of security uh, globally. You know, 25, 50 years ago, you could think of security as principally being involved in either what nations did or groups supported by nations did. But certainly what was revealed on 9-11 and has been revealed since then in countless uh, ways is that nation states, while still obviously an important security concern, are not simply the, the uh, A to Z of security. That networks enabled with uh, 
what we can do online and what we can do using modern technology can cause a, an amount of damage that is uh, potentially catastrophic. And that means we've got a much more widely distributed threat. The same principle leads me to conclude that we have a widely distributed battlefield now. Again, um, certainly in the 20th century, uh, they're putting aside the world wars, there was the idea in America that the war was outward. Uh, if it was going to be conflict, it was going to be outside of our own borders. And other than the War of 1812 um, and the attack on Pearl Harbor, all of the fighting the United States had prior to 9-11 uh, that involved a foreign nation as opposed to a civil war occurred outside of our own boundaries. So uh, it led to a certain sense that there's an away game and a home game. But what we've seen <clears throat> since 9-11 is a recognition that there's no reason to have confidence that will be true in the future. And again, if I can turn to the issue of cybersecurity, that is an area in which uh, the contest, whether it's a matter of espionage or whether it's a matter of actually seeing attacks on infrastructure, would occur on the, on the uh, uh, <clears throat> machinery and on the communications infrastructure and in the databases of the private sector uh, as, as much as it might be in the same infrastructure owned by the government, which means that everybody winds up being part of this issue. And the issue of cybersecurity becomes a matter as much for the private sector as for the public sector. We see this also in, in the area of uh, security measures in private commercial establishments. Not so much so in Washington, but if you go into New York, uh, it's pretty difficult to get into a major building uh, and not go through some kind of a security check. And again, it's because of the experience that uh, people have had, not only on 9-11, but in other instances too. So that's going to result in a much more widely distributed obligation to secure than we might have uh, experienced 50 years ago. And it's also going to raise the question of when the government cuts back on security, and clearly in, a, in an era of budget constraint, that's an, an uh, easily anticipated event, what is the private sector going to do? Because it's clear that, um, you know, given how inexpensive and easy it is to create havoc uh, in uh, private establishments, simply saying that the cost will not be picked up by the private sector is not realistic. What I suggest is going to happen is the cost is going to become much more widely distributed. And part of what government will wind up doing is trying to f uh, come up with ways to enable or assist the private sector in raising the level of its own security. We see this in the discussion in cyber security about whether the government can share information more. But I think more generally, if you look at the way we organized ourselves in, in Homeland Security after um, the department was stood up in 2003, um, a, a less noticed but important part of what the department did was to set up a mechanism for sharing uh, information and intelligence with the people who maintain critical infrastructure because they needed to have the capability to understand what the threats were, to evaluate their own vulnerabilities, and to be able to raise their level of security. So uh, as we enter into this second decade of this century, um, where we do have resource constraints, I think we have to ask ourselves, to me, a fundamental question. Um, if security is important, then I think we need to do it in a way that is balanced, but also makes the necessary investment across the board, public and private, to make sure that we're capable of executing the job. Uh, if we're not prepared to do that, then we're, we're, we're basically saying security is not that important. And, and I would venture to say that while um, it's always easy to undervalue security uh, looking forward, it's uh, having lived through the circumstance where there was a major catastrophic attack and I had the responsibility for dealing with the aftermath, uh, uh, the day of September 11th and for the months afterwards, I can guarantee it will not be undervalued in hindsight. And so for policymakers, whether they be public or private policymakers, the key is to understand, without getting hysterical about it or, or, or over-investing, uh, the need to be able to make the kinds of investments that, in retrospect, will have seemed to be reasonable and balanced uh, if something uh, happens. Thank you. <coughs> Secretary Chertoff, thank you very much. It Perhaps worth pointing out that in cyber, uh, one thing we don't necessarily know is what we normally know is who the enemy is. Right, we have absolutely right. no idea who's causing it. 
Um, and secondly, I'm very grateful to you for raising the importance of the private sector. We'll be coming back to that throughout the conference, particularly on the financial uh, and economic realities, because the private sector uh, has a major role to play in all this. It's not uh, entirely state actors who are going to be uh, providing the money and the initiatives. So can we turn to Ambassador Dobriansky? Hey, thank you very much. And first, let me say I'm very pleased to be here and uh, certainly uh, congratulate the East-West Institute and the <coughs> Carey Foundation for holding uh, this forum and this discussion. I think the topic's uh, an important one and one in which we do need to step back and to take stock of uh, the issue of affordable security. Uh, the two areas that I wanted to say uh, uh, some brief words about, one is the issue of energy security and health security. In terms of my own uh, portfolio that I did hold in government, these were two of the areas that uh, we um, uh, had collectively, I'd say, work on because it wasn't only an area for the United States, but also these are transnational issues, these are global issues and ones in which uh, they impact us all. I'd first start with the proposition relative to energy security about the importance of interconnectedness. What do I mean by interconnectedness? The whole concept of energy security is interwoven into the issue of economic growth and competition and is also interwoven into the issue of environmental stewardship. What I think you see happening in one area does impact uh, the other respective areas. The investments that you also make in one has consequences also uh, for, for the others. And this interconnectedness, I think, uh, in a positive way, has become strengthened. Uh, I think previously some of these sectors were not as interwoven and not looked at as holistically in terms of approaches, in terms of policies, and the, that nexus has uh, uh, very much been created. There are three points that I would want to make relative to the concept of energy security. The first very broad one is, is, is that I think that in these times a premium has been placed on diversified approaches. Clearly by the uh, demands for energy sources combined with the volatile international situation, uh, the questions raised about energy dependence, questions raised about also alternative energy sources. What we are witnessing is not just, I think, only in the United States, but if you look at across the globe, a greater desire for uh, not looking at a silver bullet, but a greater diversification of energy sources and investments in energy technologies and different paths forward for um, using uh, creatively sources that exist, uh, but in a more effective and efficient way. Um, secondly, I would put forth uh, the important aspect of international cooperation on certainly energy security, uh, energy security as well as energy efficiency. Here this matters greatly in terms of uh, collaborative approaches. Why does it make a difference? It certainly makes a difference in terms of actually the sharing of experiences. Those kinds of approaches that have been most effective those which have had um, problems associated with them. Naturally, you benefit, you can reduce your costs by such close sharing of experiences. Secondly, as part of that, you also, by collaborating together, you also can work together to bring down costs. Let me give a few uh, graphic examples in the area of carbon sequestration, an area which a number of countries have uh, put and made investments in, and which is, uh, by the way, substantial in terms of its costs. Uh, Norway, uh, Canada um, uh, have done a lot of work in this area. The costs are very significant in terms of the capture of carbon and then the actual storage of carbon. Um, the Australians came forward a number of years ago and established an institute. And the purpose of this institute was, in fact, actually to bring uh, various players together to look at what are the most effective ways forward, are there ways in which we could bring costs down. 
Also, uh, during uh, the um, uh, uh, time of the uh, Bush administration, <coughs> we were talking previously about the Bush administration, there was the Carbon Sequestration Leadership Forum that was established. There were quite a few countries that came forward because uh, there was a great interest in working together, putting resources together, sharing experiences, and trying to figure out are some of these paths going to actually work or are they not? And it happened in many areas. If you look at carbon sequestration, you look at hydrogen. I look out in the state of California. We have the hydrogen fuel cell partnerships. There are a number of uh, automotive uh, industries that are there uh, working together uh, 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 in establishing hydrogen uh, uh, driven uh, cars. I remember not too long ago here, just in the Washington, D.C. area, there is actually a hydrogen station set up. I'm not suggesting that that's a path forward, but what I am suggesting to you is there's a lot of innovation. That's where the private sector has certainly come in. Uh, a lot of creativity, and there are uh, ways of looking forward to how to diversify more broadly, to make us less dependent, and to make us more energy efficient. The last area that I want to mention relative to energy security is what's happening at a community level. I'm actually very struck by the great innovation that's going on in many of our um, uh, states. As you know, uh, we have issues just on a basis of a community level of dealing with the challenges of urban sprawl, the challenges of um, uh, uh, constant energy sources, the challenge of also how do you deal with transportation issues and the ramifications of transportation issues, and also the issue of material resource depletion. All of these are impacting many of our communities. Well, there are a number of communities that are now very focused on the question of urban planning, because as we know, in every community there's growth, and with growth, in turn, then you also have at the same time actually steps that are being taken and built in right at the front end in terms of energy efficient buildings, energy efficient transportation systems. To give you one example, again, in the state of California, you have uh, the community of San Jose. Um, uh, I have, in fact, a uh, USA Today um, article. It was uh, uh, put out uh, a few years ago, but it said San Jose is moving closer to becoming the nation's first totally energy independent city. And it talked about, actually, in the article, the various kinds of steps being taken in terms of how it's dealing with its electrical power sources, um, getting uh, also tapping into clean renewable sources, as well as diverting 100% of its waste from landfills and converting it into energy. The point just is, that is also what we are seeing. And I would submit just on this piece on energy security, uh, you're seeing more pu public-private sector partnerships, greater creativity in terms of research being put in these areas, and looking not only at short-term issues, but our investments for the longer term. Let me say a few words on health security. I especially wanted to say a few words about this because from my own career being in foreign policy and having been at the State Department, this is actually an issue that I would say came into being in more recent years. And the reason being is because health is perceived as a national security issue. Uh, when you were impacted by uh, uh, pandemics, pandemics in turn can affect your workforce, it affects your economy, it affects as well uh, your military force, it can impact security. There are so many different um, uh, impacts that result from uh, the health sector. I would simply put forth here that what one does in terms of preparedness and prevention, which are low cost steps that can be undertaken up front, uh, literally can have an impact in terms of cost saving down the road. In terms of the figures of SARS, I remember when the, both the Singapore uh, government came forward and Hong Kong at the time talked about the uh, uh, billions of dollars that were impacted in terms of economic costs. When I looked at avian influenza and then also right up to the present time, actually some of the opportunities here in terms of global preparedness, transnational uh, um, uh, uh, sharing of experience, and also not only the sharing of experience, but the investments that were made collectively into immunization as well as laboratories across the globe. 
Simply put, this is one area that gets often overlooked, and it's an area that does have a direct impact on security. And actually, if there are steps, education, some preparedness, some transnational steps that are taken up front that are low cost, one can actually prevent a very uh, sizable uh, impact um, uh, affecting our security from being deterred or uh, diverted, if you will. Simply put, I'll end on this note, just two examples. Again, the private sector, public-private partnerships play a, an important role. And also, I think what one does in terms of preparedness now can certainly uh, lower costs, uh, certainly for the long term. Thank you. That was amazing. You're five seconds off, 10 minutes. Quite incredible. <laughs> I wasn't looking. Now I no, see the numbers brilliant. up there. Okay. <laughs> brilliant. Um, two observations. I'm very glad that you raised the point about communities because uh, there's a new word that's entered the lexicon effectively relating to local solutions to global problems. Glocal, not a nice word. But um, the bottom-up solution geographically is a very interesting one. Uh, the other point I would simply raise in terms of energy, and I'm sure we'll get to it, but nuclear wasn't mentioned by you. I only mentioned it in the context of the fact that uh, I think most people accept that nuclear has a role, um, particularly until the renewables and alternatives have really kicked in down the line. And the accident in Japan has had a major impact in the short term on the usage of nuclear. Uh, most of the Japanese plants are shut down now, and that's having an impact on oil and the price and the issue that we raised earlier. Um, so, Jim, over to you. Um, <clears throat> well, it's good to be here. Uh, thank you for inviting. I feel a little uncomfortable. I'm not an expert on actually any of these issues. <laughs> and so you might wonder, well, I'm a businessman, but I have a rule with my assistant. When John Morose, the, the president, he calls, I just do what he tells me to do, and that's it. Now I wish my assistant would have looked a little more into what the topic is, <laughs> as I sit here. But uh, let me take a whole different angle on it, just kind of hang a reckless thought on you, and then, then you can do whatever you want with it. But <clears throat> big money is most always in getting farther left on the curve. And, and the reason I say that is, you know, listening to Joe talk about all the expense of war, the, we don't do a very good job of having math and metrics on all the things people thought before there was revolution. Do you see what I mean? There's a famous story down in uh, Texas. Uh, Lady Bird Johnson went in and said that she wanted the budget doubled for a litter. She hated litter. This is about 35 years ago. So anyway, somebody sitting at the table so the governor said, yeah, we'll double it. So I don't know if it was $200 million to $400 million. And somebody at the table raised their hand and said, why don't we just not have them litter? Now, with all due respect, that's a Nobel Prize moment. I, somebody should have gotten a <laughs> damn Nobel Prize for that. But how as humans and leaders could we have not thought of that? I'm 60 now. And when my dad and I would go fishing when I was 10, so that's 50 years ago. And by the way, my dad was out in Nebraska. He's a good guy, he taught school at the University of Nebraska. He wasn't a redneck or that. But when we go fishing, <laughs> I say that because we'd throw our sacks out the window and the, the, that my mother would make, and the stuff would just blow down the highway. And if you would have been standing there 50 years ago and saw Dad and I do that, you know what you would have thought? Nothing. Because there was no concept for litter. So as leaders, it's just amazing to me, but what we did is we just spent money picking it up until somebody said, hey, why don't we have them not do that? Now I look at the biggest expense that we have in the United States, and it's health care, $2.5 trillion. By the way, on a nerdy day, I did the math at 6.2% growth over 10 years. You had the stubs above the $2.5 trillion we already don't have, and it's $10 trillion. So there's $10 trillion of money that we don't have coming in is three times bigger than the subprime, so I'm going to say the subprime meltdown is three trillion, I don't know, three times bigger. And you know what we're doing right down the street here? We're, we're trying to figure out who's going to pay for it. But it's sort of deja vu all over again with, with picking up the litter. You see, we're trying to figure out how do we pick up that litter rather than prevention. I don't know if it's true or not, but CDC just reported 
that of the two and a half trillion growing to four and a half in 10 years, 70% of it's preventable. Why, why isn't that on the front page of every newspaper? But somehow as leaders, we go back, start trying to figure out how to, you know, the health care bill that everybody's arguing today in the stream. That's just about moving the money around. It doesn't have anything to do with reducing it. So we spend $8,000 a person on health care. Good countries like Canada, Germany, France, and England, they spend $4,000. You all know these facts. Who lives longer? They do. So it makes you wonder if we're spending 8000 what the hell is going to happen to us when it goes to 10000 and we're going to die even faster. <laughs> so, I mean, it's not like what we're doing, picking up the, but, but we're, we're picking up the litter, not actually fixing health. Not, we don't even have a conversation about real prevention. But I worry about this subject here, too. Remember, my background is a businessman. I just finished a study for Wells Fargo, and the sample size is a million. So if anybody does surveys in here, I, and I laugh at these surveys out of New York Times or whatever, and I don't mean to start competitive, they do a sample of a thousand. But we just finished a sample of a million. We do a million a year for Wells Fargo, and we so meticulously count and sort what is on the minds of every single person. It's unbelievable. I mean, if you, if, if that CEO and I were both sitting here and we said, we're those people, they can, he, he'll pass a pop quiz like you can't believe on what every customer is doing. By the way, Wells Fargo has the highest market cap of any bank in the world, bigger than Goldman Sachs, Bank of America, and Morgan Stanley added together. Go check it today on your. But it's because they know all the behavioral economics, all the derivatives of what they're thinking before they do something. Here's something you can go ask anybody in intelligence at the Pentagon or at the State Department. Ask them about the relationship between Muslims in the West is getting a little better, a little worse, or staying about the same? The honest God answer is they don't know. How the hell are you trying to manage prevention if you can't answer the most simplest question of all? They don't know if it's getting better. Is suffering going up or down in Egypt? That's the million dollar question, but it'd be like if you were all stock analysts and I said, is the price of Apple going up or down? Or you say, I don't know, we don't really keep track of it. Well, that's exactly where we are with Intel defense. We're just, pick, we're just picking, up the, picking up the litter. But now it gets even more tricky, but, but the ignorance is just unbelievable to me. I, I can say that because I'm just a businessman watching. And I talk with Intel people and I ask them these questions. And I say, when everybody's so mad in Egypt, how come you guys didn't see it coming? $90 billion a year and not a single one of you had any idea at all. So then you go to the World Economic Forum, they put their list out and they say, Tunisia, is the model of economic blah, 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 blah. <laughs> you know, they don't have any behavioral economics because, so Gallup does meticulous tracking in 160 countries, but suffering is skyrocketing in those countries. But see, when you're watching GDP and all the easy stuff, remember, those are all things after the fact, right? So you're managing behind the curve. Um, but all those numbers are going up very quickly. So you say, well, I thought things should be good because GDP is going up. What is it? I say, well, they hate, the, they hate the West. They hate America. That's what they're mad. Young males are mad. So when we track, when we ask them what they're angry about, do you know what it is? It's actually about jobs. Now, it gets even trickier, you guys, because if you say, well, how come you're so much for the, the, brotherhood, the Muslim Brotherhood and the Salafists and the Islamists and all that? Because they didn't have much interest in them when the election started. They think they're more likely to help with economics and job creation. But all of Intel, all of state, they'll all flunk that quiz. Now the derivative goes down just a little bit deeper. But if you said, what can I do, I, I would have a rank order on how dangerous countries are, how dangerous populations of people are. So you say, well, do you have any idea what a dangerous person is? Yeah, I'm, and I'm just a businessman, and I can do a better job than any of them just, just by asking questions. Here it is. If I'm out of a job, and I'm a young male, especially in the Middle East, I'm not doing real well. But if you say, Jim, do you have hope to get a job? And I say, yeah, I do have hope. I'm OK. So somebody somewhere in this government ought to mark that down that I'm OK. But if Joe, if we say, do you have a job? And we say, do you have hope to get a job? And he says, no, that's hopelessness. Now he's starting to, he's starting to get dangerous, and I'm fine. Now 
another little piece you put in the cocktail is you say, um, do, you, um, do you think your government is corrupt? And if he says yes to that, now his danger goes way up because he thinks the reason that he has no job and no hope for a job is the government's fault. Then if we just sprinkle in a little bit of this one, have you worried about food in the last few months? And he says yes to that. Now you've got a really dangerous guy. Here's something that no one knows. Unless you can mathematically describe that, you, you can't manage it. So you don't have any chance at all. So all you can do is just pick up, pick up the litter. You said, is there any kind of silver bullet in all this for the United States to manage? Yeah, manage the momentum. Because there's, ex there, there's, there's the right amount of suffering and uh, anger in countries. So like right now in, let's take England, the amount of suffering is only about 4%. The amount of suffering in Sudan is about 20%. That, that's the right amount of suffering. You know, you know what I mean by right amount for Sudan. But what you watch for is, if you said, now I've got to predict revolution, by the way, which nobody can do in, at the Pentagon, State Department, anywhere else, it's just like anything else in a stock. You watch where the, moment, where the momentum is. Because if in Sudan, if you said, what do we do to fix that? Or in Egypt or wherever it is, because Egypt's suffering is still going up, you don't need to fix it overnight. Leadership's job with strong hands is just to get the damn thing headed the right way. And when you do, that does fix it because it's not the location of the statistic, it's the direction and speed of the statistic. And when you manage that, then you can prevent uh, all the things that we don't, that we don't want. My, my only, if you want to save a lot of money, trillions and trillions, and the, the numbers are, are, are colossal, we're never going to do that until we have a different operating system. Five, four, three, <laughs> fantastic. Absolutely wonderful. Wonderful. You know, um, uh, I just stop when I see it. It's, um, it's one of the tricks of the private sector to minimize expectations, which you did brilliantly and blew us all away. I have to say that that was a, a magnificent contribution. I believe that you compile that index of job, hope of job, corruption, food. There were some statistics I seem to recall which predicted absolutely specifically what happened, but we haven't time to go into it now. But I, I advise all of us to try and follow that closely. I did want to ask Professor Stiglitz if he had one question uh, that resulted from this panel that you wanted to ask with burning intensity. Oh, let me, can I ask two? Just yeah, very, fine. Uh, uh, <laughs> Nobel Prize what, gets you a okay, long way. Uh, uh, <laughs> one of them is in terms of energy security, um, one of the uh, uh, advantages of some of the new technologies is that they have distributed uh, systems. You know, the, the old system is you have big power plants, uh, you have to move oil long distances, you make our system very vulnerable. The, nature, the good thing about the sun is it's most places, and uh, renewables have the, ba uh, especially solar energy, is a system that is much more distributive and that makes it, in some fundamental sense, more secure. And it has the advantage, uh, in addition, that it doesn't, uh, it addresses the problem of global warming, which is one of the big sources of, of stress that, that uh, is, would be showing. So uh, it seems to me that there should have been, or should be a lot more focus in energy security, in moving in, in that kind of direction uh, that has at least two, two benefits. And let me ask uh, you uh, one question or a That's comment. That's a better question for her. Uh, what? That, that, that's a better question for, for her. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I have one question for you. <laughs> okay. Which is, which is, um, there in economics, there's uh, in behavioral economics a lot of research that shows that one of the things that people care a lot about is a sense of fairness. And when I look at what happened in Tunisia and to some extent in in Egypt, um, one way of looking at the corruption is that it is. Uh, of such concern because the system is viewed not to be fair. But there are lots of other ways in which the system can't be fair. Uh, if you see, you know, that, that people who graduate do well in school, they don't get good jobs. Uh, but people with connections have, get good jobs. That can also generate uh, a sense of unfairness and uh, stress and all those other uh, uh, kinds of adverse things that you were worried about. So 
I guess the, the question is, is corruption actually just one aspect of a broader sense of unfairness that you, we ought to be trying to assess? And obviously unfairness is a, a question of perception, but obviously, as you say, the way, way things are moving is very important in, uh, in that. Questions about mobility, what are your chances of going up? Uh, uh, and in a lot of these societies, a lot of stagnation, a lot of difficulties of, of moving up. Have to be very brief answers, and it may be we may have to file the questions. But is there a quick response to it? Well, my, my very quick response is: I think, as I said, I think that the diversified approach is the best one. Secondly, I think each locality needs to determine what is the percentage of uh, investment in which energy source. So maybe renewables might be a larger percentage in one area. Spain, for example, uh, uh, has invested heavily in wind, as we know. State of Hawaii has actually undertaken some legislation to also draw down its imports of oil and place a premium on renewables. But other areas, it may not work. So my answer is diversified approach is the best. And certainly, that has to be one in the mix, including nuclear. Thank so, um, I'll respond to your the corruption and cronyism is brutal, and and um, it, again, especially when it's rising. I saw I saw Danny Kahneman do a presentation. He's so interested in it, but the theory is that you get used to it. That there's used to it. Well, it's Mexico, you know, so we're all bribed. It's Russia. I mean, that's how you do things. But he, he said you never do, he, he, pr he controlled for that, and you never actually do get used to it. And so now as bad as that is for countries, you know, the, the global migration patterns, it's all very good for the United States. Now I'm speaking competitively as American because it drives the stars out of those countries. So if you're a superstar in Bangalore, and in India's corruption, our index is just horrible. I mean, uh, worse than. I mean, it goes clear down to the lowest income people. Where China, it's more. It's more at the more at the top. But what it does is because then because of the cronyism, you can't you can't become a millionaire or have success in one in one lifetime if you start too low. But that's what drives those superstars to Silicon Valley and all, and all that. So it's a brutal condition for real sustainable job creation. Um, but I think it serves us. Americans are a lot more honest than we give ourselves credit for, and contract law here is really strong. And all those of you that have done business worldwide, contracts aren't very good once you, once you leave the United States. Well, please join me in thanking our outstanding panel. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thanks very much.